news articles that I thought were interesting. Uh, we've all heard a lot of those Zempic and uh, related drugs that cause you to lose about 20% of your weight, but you have to inject every month, and it costs seven or $9,000 a year. And that is now projected to be the most valuable drug ever invented because 80% of Americans would be candidates for that thing uh, when it becomes more readily available. But there's a new one, even much better. One huge problem with Ozempic is something like 90% of people quit taking it after a while because they can't stand the side effects. In fact, um, the side effects are nausea and vomiting, which is probably why you lose weight, <laughs> which is why it was originally intended for a different purpose. And they discovered, hey, you lose weight. Everybody take this to lose weight. And I said, well, yeah, but nobody can stand it. So, and when you stop, all the weight comes back. So it's arguably not that great an idea, but this new one targets two techniques. The Ozempic targets just uh, your suppression of your appetite, but this new drug affects both your appetite and it affects the way you, you digest sugar so that more of the sugar goes into your muscles and it doesn't stay in your blood, which is very important for diabetes. And the other thing about it is after you stop taking it, the effects persist. You continue to have a lower weight although they've only tested it in mice so far. So it sounds like it'll be several years before it's ready for human use, but when it does come, it'll be a whole lot better than Ozempic. And like I said, within the next five to 10 years, there should be really good weight loss drugs that actually work as opposed to all the snake oil we've had forever and stuff that works like amphetamines that work but have side effects that are so terrible nobody can really stand it for long. So, um, very soon, there'll be huge amounts of Americans on weight loss drugs, I think, after the weight loss drugs get safer and better. What's the name of the drug? I don't think it has a brand name or anything yet. It's, um, it's a new class of compounds, and uh, I don't think it has anything other than a long chemical name right now. Gotcha. Yeah, it's not... They're, they're talking about moving into human trials soon. Gotcha. Yeah, so, you know, that's why... Uh, this is why... Uh, you remember there was a famous movie about um, a guy sneaking off to Mexico to get unapproved AIDS drugs? It's always this way. There are experimental drugs, and then there's this long time period of like five or ten years of testing it before you can get them approved in America, and people want them right away from trials like this. Like my sister is in nursing, and she keeps saying, they can do anything in mice. Everybody has a trial. Everything can be cured in mice, but that doesn't mean it works in people. And like usually, it will never make it to humans because it will turn out not to be this wonderful. <laughs> You know, uh, anyway, that's why people often get desperate and rush off and get unapproved drugs. And, you know, uh, you can argue that they're too conservative here. They are pretty conservative. They really won't let you sell anything unless you have really, really proven that it's safe and effective. <laughs> and uh, anyway, so I was amazed. This is an operating system that is only 512 bytes large. So I don't even know how that works at all. That would be kind of interesting to look at. That's a really small OS, although there used to be Linux um, distributions that were small enough to fit on a floppy disk. But this is not even one kilobyte. I've never heard of one so small. So it'd be sort of fun to find out what the heck it does. It can't do much. <laughs> um, all right, and this one here, um, there's a study that came out maybe six years ago from, I think, UC Berkeley, where they found that you could type on a keyboard and they could pick up the sound of the typing and figure out what keys you were pressing because the vibrations inside the keyboard are different in different places. And if you hit same key twice, that's different than right hand, left hand, and stuff like that. And this guy has now written, there's some kind of open source version you can download and run. And there's even an online demo where you don't have to install anything. And when I tried it briefly at home, it didn't work, which is what a lot of people say. But they say if you put a microphone near the keyboard and have a noisy keyboard and you turn it way up and you really type a whole page of text to train it, it will be able to detect your key presses from the uh, from the typing. So that's interesting. Maybe, maybe you need a noisy keyboard. That's right. That's right. I had an external. Yeah. You know. Anyway, I didn't. I didn't try it very seriously. But anyway, um, if, if you want to play with it, it's now easier to get at. So that's nice. So CISA you know, the, the uh, government agency to help you secure your systems now has recommendations to harden your network, and these are not very surprising. Establish a baseline of normal network activity, conduct regular assessments, and enforce phishing-resistant MFA, which is what everybody says, multi-factor authentication to stop phishing is, is always like the number one thing everyone recommends, probably the one thing that would help you most. People get phished all the time, and Google, about two years ago, said they switched to 100% 
um, USB key-based multi-factor authentication, not the kind that comes with an SMS on your phone or even with an app on your phone, but a hardware device you plug into your machine or put near your machine to connect by Bluetooth that really makes sure that piece of hardware is near the machine that's logging in. And therefore, nobody else can copy your password and log in from somewhere else. They have to really be you with the physical device. And they said that cut their phishing to zero. They said that really works. And that's what they say. That's, of course, the number one thing you could do. Um, that would stop the number one way everybody gets in. Anyway, um, and I ought to mention, a lot of people ask me about ransomware, and I must say I'm very impressed with the security of one of my clients I consult for. You, can't, they, you have to use a cloud machine. They give you a cloud Windows desktop on, I suppose, Azure, and you have to log into this virtual desktop, with two-factor authentication, and then you, that's all you can do, and you're not the administrator. You can't install anything. If you want to install anything, you have to submit like a ticket to the help desk. You have to go to their special store where they have apps you can download that have been tested, and that's it. You can only install officially approved apps. They're not messing around, and they're not going to get ransomware, I think. I, I could click on a link. I could open an email message. Hey, you're not going to get ransomware in that kind of situation. That's how you do it. <laughs> anyway, um, so I was amazed by this. There's a homeless coder in San Francisco. This guy is a coder, and yet he's homeless. He said he lived in a single, a res, temporary residency hotel until he exceeded the limit, then he couldn't find a place to stay, then he started living in his car, and he just talks about it. Um, he hang, his laptop hooks up to the solar power, and he finds places to hang out, and uh, apparently he's not able to find a job well enough to pay the rent, which I think is not that rare around here. <laughs> anyway, um, it's sort of an interesting story. Uh, I remember uh, there's a time when... Uh, when we were holding um, interviews for a part-time position here, and the prospective teachers that wanted to take that position were meeting. And while they were meeting, they were talking about how easy it would be to like park a van out there and try living in a car because you couldn't afford to rent around here, which is really common. I remember one of the jobs one of them was looking at was a postdoc in Berkeley where you already had a PhD and you went for more or something like that, or else a graduate program, and they paid, it was full-time teaching for $40,000. And you're supposed to live in Berkeley on that which is insane. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I knew a guy that lived in Berkeley. His rent was, I think, $200 a month. He lived in the corner of a burned-down greenhouse that was still standing. <laughs> I lived in a truck around here for a while. You know, you can do it. It's, weather's pretty good, but, uh, but, you know, it's not quite the American dream that our parents were thinking of. <laughs> but the white picket fence in the house. <laughs> anyway. Uh, this, I think, is why our political situation is so bad, because uh, the studies have shown this is the first generation where the kids are poorer than the parents. And when that happens, people feel like your society is bad, you're going in the wrong direction. You know, every parent wants, my kid will have a better life than me. And that was true, but it's not true anymore, not in America. And that's, that's when people get very upset and say something is very wrong here. Anyway, so um, I didn't know this, but in retrospect, it's not too surprising. You see, if you want to know what a plant is, you can get it directly from the iPhone, because apparently iPhone has a built-in image search, sort of like Google image search, so you can take a picture of something and search for it and say, what is this from the picture? And it will therefore find out what the plant is. So that's interesting. Um, yeah, it sounds pretty good. I thought that'd be fun. So this is a very good story of something I get a lot from students. Um, this is, explains how SIM swapping affected this person, and she tried to track down what happened. So it was very interesting. So she just um, got alerts like on the weekend that something was wrong with her ac accounts and couldn't figure out what the problem is, and then eventually found out somebody was stealing tons of money from her credit cards. And what they did, they did SIM swapping where they went, they made a, um, someone asked where I post the news articles. I'll put the link up here. I have a news link on my home page. Here's where they go. All right, so um, the so what she did was she checked and found this person made a the original thing they did, they got a copy of her replacement credit card, or they got her original replacement credit card. In fact, she eventually tracked it down. There was a theft inside the post office at a major center because she never got a replacement credit card. And she was still using the old one that hadn't expired yet. This person got their replacement credit card. Then they got her phone number, and they went into a phone office with that card and said, I lost my phone, here's my card to prove who I am, so switch it to this other phone. So now they can get in her phone, and that with SMS messages is what approved getting into her bank account. So they would send SMS messages, and, now she, and they could answer that, and she didn't know any of this had happened, so they were already using a credit card, and they managed to get a new credit card and start spending money on that 
all before she even knew anything was happening. And then she tried to get help from these companies, like who hacked me, I want the information. They said, oh, we can't tell you anything because you need a court order. And then other people refused because they said, oh, they reversed the charges, so you don't have any real damages, so the cops didn't care. Then the credit card company that reversed the charges, unreversed the charges, and tried billing her $10,000 anyway. And she just went back and forth and spent hundreds of hours arguing with all these people, which is what happens. They've said the average person that gets hacked, they end up with, uh, with spending, I think, like months of work and like $800 of money to get restored to normal. And another thing they say is if you do get your identity stolen, you are very, very high risk of having it stolen again, which would make sense because they found some way into your life and it's likely that they'll try it again or somebody will find the same hole. So, would this be possible with eSIM? Um, I don't know much of anything about eSIM, but I think it would because it had nothing to do with the hardware. The, the way SIM swapping works is they call the phone company and convince them that they are you. They tell them, I lost my phone, you got to move to this new phone, which happens all the time. People lose their phone, and they have it's a normal tech support thing to go to the new phone, and they usually don't hassle you a whole lot about proving who you are. They're mostly concerned with helping the customer. So you just have to perform social engineering, just convince them, oh, I'm desperate, I need my, there's all important phone calls. Especially if you're calling them on the phone, they can hardly ask you to show your ID and stuff. That's why I, I can see how it works. Just so, Well, yeah but, they, yeah, but you don't have the SIM card. They call it SIM swapping, but it doesn't really involve stealing the card. They call it SIM swapping where you call the phone company and move it to a new phone. That's why it's probably not a good term for this attack. I mean, originally heard it, I thought that meant they somehow steal the card, but that's not true. That's what it is. They just convinced the phone company to reroute your calls to a new phone. Yeah. Yep, just try it. That's right. There's another important thing G.J. Spinning put here. Um, what many, many people do when they get hacked is they want to find the hacker and punish them. And this, you have to just get this out of your mind. It's a natural response, but that isn't going to benefit you. The fact is, that's for cops to do, and 90% of the time they can't do it. And you know, chasing that is not helping you any to spend your time trying to find the hacker and punish them. The only thing that's reasonable is to recover your stuff and, if possible, improve your security. That's going to help you. Same thing at companies. Most companies, or sometimes people that run companies say, I really want to find the hacker. And it's usually not in any way beneficial to you. You know, realistically, um, if the hacker got in, another hacker could come in the same way. So even if you were able to punish that one hacker, that wouldn't really stop the, the risk very much. What, what would stop the risk is just trying to improve your security posture and recovering from your origin, original problem. Anyway, um, I've, I heard an article today, I think from NPR or something, where they said they went to a Chinese, kind of China just had a conference of legislators, like a, some kind of open session about, and they said they're very, very angry at America. They say America is trying to beat them to death and strangle them because that's not a that's not a bad statement of what we're doing. We're stopping them from getting the chips to make high tech on chips. We're trying to stop them from developing AI. We're trying to stop them from taking the territories near them they want to take. They feel like we're crushing them and trying to hold them back because we are trying to crush them and hold them back. And so it's getting it's getting very very hostile between U.S. and China. And um, so China is now going to perform a cybersecurity audit of Micron. Micron's been complaining about this for a while. Micron is apparently a company outside China, but 70% of their sales are inside China. And they've been saying, like I've been saying for the last couple of years, please stop being so hostile with China, man. If, if America and China really don't get along, that's going to ruin everything for us. And, but it's, they are. Now, now America is blocking Huawei and a lot of other stuff here from China. And now China is starting to block stuff for America. And, and people say we're, we're already in a cold war and we're headed for maybe a hot war pretty soon. Uh, as both sides are just getting more and more angry and more and more angry rhetoric and all this stuff about TikTok shows our lawmakers just being, and Trump was all full of the China virus and everything, and our lawmakers are very, very hostile to China, and China's lawmakers are really, really hostile to us. This is not healthy, but it's getting worse and worse on both sides. Now, someone says you got a phone stolen, and the police said they could do nothing. Well, yes. Oh, I think that's true. Um, if Even if you have something stolen with one of those air tags on them, the cops usually can't do anything. Um, is this a full cold war? I mean, right now, Yes, this is already what you call a cold war, yeah. I think, I think China is trying to figure out is, is, is a war, so. Yes, <laughs> I know, and. Uh, well, we, well, we rumor had this had a, like, um, trap, 14 millimeter trap lined up and running, so. Huawei has a new factory up and running? 
Oh, 14 millimeter, right, right. 14 nanometer. Yeah, but people now have like 5 nanometer and even 3 nanometer, and we're blocking China from getting that capability. The seven nanometer, yeah, seven yeah that's right. To me, so we are prevent. Suppo America is supposedly preventing them from catching up. But then it's like uh, they haven't figured out everything yet, so the the U is crappy. So <laughs> yeah, that's right, that's right. Anyway. Um, yes, by the way, uh, DJ spinning post in here, Huawei deserved it. Apparently it did. I saw an article from a couple of years ago that Huawei actually had uh, undocumented backdoor passwords into the stuff. So they, they, they have to do, they have to, uh, they sell the network maintenance, right? They, so they have to have some backdoor somehow. So well, that, they might have said that, but the fact is it's not considered so good also, practice. Also Cisco. No, no. Well, no. It's no longer considered acceptable. It hasn't been in at least ten years. I mean, if Cisco does it. They stop it. Yeah, that used so to when really. They, when they do maintenance of the network, network uh, equipment, they have to have somewhere to get in. So, you know, no, I no, know, I, no, I don't think so. How do you expect them to, to do maintenance? No, no, no. This is very important. This used to be standard. What you're saying, saying uh, when you buy equipment, it comes to the back door for they can do maintenance. This is only true if you sign a contract with them and agree to that. Yeah. If you don't then there shouldn't be any factor you don't know about. If you're so putting you it in your own corporation. You, you yeah. Kind of, kind of out, out yeah, time. but I mean, anyway, it was an undocumented backdoor. People were buying stuff with the backdoor they didn't know about, and that is considered unacceptable anywhere these days. 20 years ago, maybe not, but, but now, yeah. And someone says they ripped Cisco iOS off so much. Yes, absolutely. Anyway, um, I'm going to stop the news and go on to the official stuff. This is good.